Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update from Rao's IAS. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of UPSC Civil Services Examination. Today we have taken up Delhi edition of The Hindu Newspaper dated 23rd of February 2021. The articles which we are going to cover today are displayed on the screen. Let us now begin the discussion. Sedition lies in the effect not in content appears on page number 7. So as we all know that activist Disha Ravi has been sent to a fresh one-day police custody in toolkit case. And the Delhi police had registered a sedition case earlier this month over this particular instance. And that is why Mr. Satvik Verma, who is also a lawyer, has written an article articulating his views and opinions on the matter of sedition in India. He has discussed some of the important Supreme Court judgments, for example, Kedarnath Singh versus State of Bihar. And so what we have done is that we have accumulated everything in one discussion. First, we are going to understand what sedition is. What are the different meanings of the sedition? What are the explanation to section 124A of Indian Penal Code through which the sedition derives its legislative backing? How it has been applied so far as far as famous instances in past 10 years are concerned? The Supreme Court cases and their implications on how the sedition cases are to be processed? And then finally, is there a case for sedition to stay or to go? And finally, what can be the way forward? Now, sedition, since it is in news always, can be a very, very important topic for mains 2021. And so, let us now begin the discussion. So, before anything, let us just first understand the meaning of the word sedition. Sedition is a very particular term which denotes an act which is an incitement of discontent against the government or an act which leads to rebellion against the government. Or in other words, any action, especially in speech or writing, which promotes discontent or rebellion against the government. Now that is problematic even in a democratic setup because in democratic setup, the constitution of India lays down a procedure through which a government is formed. And it also at the same time lays down the procedure through which a particular government can be removed. Apart from that, various mechanisms being provided in the constitution and law provide for enough safety mechanisms so that the government actions can be challenged. And so it is safe to assume that a lot of checks and balances have been provided not only within the institutions but also to the common public through which all illegal and immoral actions of the government can be challenged and can be stalled. And so the idea behind the sedition law is that if so many mechanisms have been provided in the hands of the citizenry, there is no need for the citizens to rebel against the state or against the government. Now the problem over here is that there is a very thin line between the criticism of a government or a state and incitement of discontent or leading to rebellion. And that thin line is where the problem and issues of uses and misuses with respect to the sedition law comes into play. And let us understand how the wording of section 124A of IPC, which provides for the penalty against the sedition, comes into play. So section 124A of IPC creates mechanism to check sedition in our country. And you should be surprised to know that it was introduced by British Raj in 1870. Now the problem is not that it was introduced by Britishers. Because a lot of laws which we use currently have been introduced by Britishers. But the problem is that it was introduced by Britishers in order to check the nationalist movement, in order to arrest and send the freedom fighters to jail. And that's where the problem lies. We are continuing with the law which was enacted to curb our own freedoms. And since independence, we have still stuck to the same law which Britishers themselves have repealed. So let us now look at section 124A and see what it talks about. Whoever by words either spoken or written or by signs or by visible representation or otherwise brings or attempts to bring into hatred or contempt or excites or attempts to excite disaffection towards the government established by law in India shall be punished with imprisonment for life to which fine may be added. So it starts with whoever which means it is applicable to anyone then the actions being committed by that whoever person can range from speech, drawing or any other kind of visible representation which 
either directly brings or which the state or the government thinks is attempting to bring either contempt or hatred or disaffection against the government established by law. Now these words are where the problems start. Although section 124 of IPC contains few explanations as well. So this explanation number one says that the expression disaffection includes disloyalty and all feelings of enmity. So whenever an action induces disloyalty in the citizens, the provisions of section 124 or the sedition can be applicable. But there are two other sets of explanation which try to put a limit on the misuse of the sedition law which is comments expressing disapprobation of measures of the government with a view to obtain their alteration by lawful means without exciting or attempting to excite hatred, contempt or disaffection do not constitute an offence under this section. And similarly, criticism of administration through lawful means shall not be considered as sedition. So which means that, let's say there is a scheme, Atmanirbhar Bharat, a journalist publishes an article criticizing measures taken by the government of India in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic. Now, that criticism, as well as if the journalist or the writer of the article suggests some alteration in the policy, and since she is doing it through lawful means, which means that the article nowhere suggests the replacement of the government, it just talks about alteration of the policy or government policy or the administration, it shall not be counted in sedition. So now the cursory reading of this particular section, the provision against sedition, will lead you to believe that everything is good and there is no problem and so why the fuzz? And to judge the efficacy of any law, you have to look at its applications. And now let's see a few of the prominent cases in past 10 years and see how in reality the provisions of the section 124A have been used by various state governments. Starting with arrest of Asim Trivedi in 2012. So cartoonist Asim Trivedi was arrested in 2012 because he had published few cartoons on politicians. Then in 2012 and 13, we know that a lot of protests were going on in Tamil Nadu against the Kudankulam nuclear power plant. And the sedition case was filed against almost the complete village which was protesting against this particular nuclear power plant. Similarly, recently in 2020, Amulya Leona was booked under sedition because she raised slogan Pakistan Zindabad along with various other countries' names which she took. Then many sedition cases have been filed against the protester demanding revocation or reversal of Citizenship Amendment Act 2019. So clearly we can see that as far as the use of sedition law is concerned, clearly dissent criticism of government and questioning of politicians and government policies, all of which are very fundamental to a democracy, have come to be treated as sedition by police. Okay, if this is the case, then let's see how many of these cases which are filed initially lead to conviction in the same offence. And so, the graph which you see on your screen shows the number of cases related to sedition filed across the country in a particular year and which ranges between 30 and in 2018 it went up to 7. And so in general around 30 to 50 cases are filed each year dealing with sedition. Filing of cases are not important. What is important is upholding of these cases by the judiciary that is leading to final conviction. Only then we will know that the sedition case filed by the police upheld the scrutiny of the judiciary and if you see that data it is dismally one per year in 2016 17 and in 18 one one and two cases led to conviction out of more than 60 to 70 filed that year which in itself shows that most of the cases which are filed fail to stand up to the scrutiny of the judiciary and why is that and that is because of the two important judgment. One is Kedarnath Singh versus State of Bihar and next one is Kanahiya Kumar case. The judgments given by the Supreme Court in both these cases act as a guiding light for judiciary in order to determine the case under 124A or the sedition law. So this particular case took place in 1962 where the Supreme Court upheld section 124A and held that section 124 struck the correct balance between fundamental rights and the need for public order. So the validity of section 124A was challenged and it was proposed that it violates the fundamental right. But Supreme Court held that no, it does not. 
and in fact it is a right balance between the need for a public order we need laws to ensure public order and fundamental rights but the court had significantly reduced the scope of sedition law and what it did is that it limited the scope to only those cases where there is an incitement to imminent violence towards the overthrow of the state incitement to imminent violence so any speech action or publication which calls for immediate violent step against the overthrowing of the government or the state will attract sedition further the court said that it is not mere against government of the day but the institutions as the symbol of the state so after this important judgment now it has become clear that unless and until the speech which calls for immediate violent overthrow of the government of india or the state of india except for that except the police is able to demonstrate this imminent danger to the stability of the state there shall not be any sedition case and similarly in kanhaiya kumar case the supreme court redefined seditious act only if it had essential ingredients and it listed out three disruption of public order attempt to violently overthrow a government or threatening the security of the state and now you can easily understand that why even though the number of cases which are filed are 50 to 70 each year but only one or two of them lead to conviction only because these two supreme court guidelines are on work and now an obvious question which arises is that when the conviction rate is so low why police even files the cases and for that we will have to revisit the provisions of section 124a we know that this offense is cognizable and non bailable and so whenever the government is threatened by an publication or political opponents as soon as the case is filed bail as a matter of right is denied and for getting the bail that person will have to first knock on the doors of the judiciary and so what is guaranteed is few days weeks or even months of jail term or police or judicial remand and that threat is used to stifle the dissent or free speech and that is why so many cases are filed even though they do not lead to conviction and hence prominent public thinkers have argued against this particular seditious law and called for its removal at the same time we know that this law is here to stay and there is no proposed amendment for this particular act and so we will discuss arguments for and against sedition law so the first and foremost argument is that it is against democratic norms just for the simple reason that it was enacted by the britishers against the indian people it in its basic nature in its core it stifles the democratic and fundamental right of people to criticize the government and more often than not it is used just for the same purpose then the next argument is the inadequate capacity of the local police stations to be able to judge the merit of a sedition case we know that the cases are filed by the police and the police might not have the requisite training to understand the consequences of imposing such a stringent provision they might not be able to understand the nuances of section 124a it is very difficult to understand the difference between expressing disagreement with the government policy or expressing disloyalty towards the government and both can be mistaken and so we don't have such capacity of state machinery then just for the simple reason that it has been misused more often than it has been used as we have seen with examples it has been used arbitrarily to curb dissent in many cases the main targets have been writers journalists activists who question government policy and the projects and even political dissenters then as the crime as we have seen is a non bailable and punishment can extend for life it has a strong deterrent effect on dissent even if it ultimately does not leads to conviction and finally since this provision has been mostly used to gag the fourth pillar of our democracy that is the press just this simple reason that most of the cases have been filed against the journalist is a strong enough reason as an argument and a strong argument against sedition law but it's not as simple as it seems there are some very solid points which indicate or which because of which the sedition law is still in existence so against the argument that it is a draconian law the people who argue in favor say that it is not really a draconian law anymore because now we have supreme court guidelines 
which have narrowed down significantly the jurisdiction of sedition law and it can be applied only on grounds laid down by the supreme court so the draconian nature has been curtailed and so there is no need to dilute or remove it then for all those people who say that this particular sedition law violates the fundamental right to free speech the argument can be made out that article 19.1 provides for various kinds of freedom but article 19.2 provides for reasonable restrictions and if you see safety and security of india and any law enacted to preserve that comes under the reasonable restrictions and will not be void of article 19.1 and so sedition law is actually an application of reasonable restriction provided for in 19.2 then the argument that it curbs the free speech also does not hold according to some people because the explanations given in section 124a have made it very very clear that one can use any kind of strong language in criticism of government policy schemes and actions without inviting sedition such freedom or dissent should not be turned into some kind of persuasion to break the country itself and so that is why it is important to have a sedition law and then one of the strongest argument comes from the existence of anti national elements in our country we have terrorists naxals who not only incite violence against the government but also produce literature which tries to sow the seed of disaffection against the indian state and so due to the presence of anti national elements and divisive forces such as naxalites separatists it is important to have such a provision in law and finally for any law the misuse can never be discounted starting from anti dowry provision to to provisions to penalize the murder all have been misused and mere misuse of a law cannot be ground for its repeal and so in the mains examination you could be expected to not only produce the arguments for and against but also as a bureaucrat or as a future bureaucrat come up with way forward or a solution and so the way forward could be the continuance of sedition law but incorporation of the supreme court guidelines given in kedarnath case and kanhaiya case into the law so article 124a should be amended to include the grounds given by the supreme court in these two cases into the act itself then there is a need for sensitization of the police or police training they should be sufficiently guided as to where the section must be imposed and where not and finally there is a need to include provisions where the government can be penalized if the action if this particular section is misused this will ensure that section 124a of ipc strikes a balance between security and smooth functioning of the state along with fundamental right of freedom of speech and expression preserved so this particular topic of sedition becomes very very important from the perspective of gs paper 2 where you could be expected to reproduce arguments both in favor as well as in against of sedition and is there a need to continue with the same law so you will first start with a very very brief introduction as to what sedition means what has been the controversial applications of this particular law which has brought this particular section into the news what have been important supreme court judgments and then arguments in favor against and then finally way forward all of this compressed in 250 words let us now move on to the next discussion so this next article which we have taken for discussion appears on page number 1 as well as page number 8 she may visit india for brics summit so china's president mr xi jinping may visit india in the second half of this year to attend brics that is a group of nations including brazil russia india china and south africa leaders meeting if a physical summit is held as is increasingly expected due to the downfall or the decline in the covid-19 pandemic and so in this respect overall perspective on brics nations are very very important because it clearly forms the part of gs paper 2 wherein the portion of international relations bilateral regional and global groupings and agreements involving india and or affecting india's interests become very very important we know that india has been the member of brics since its genesis and of course the group of five nations are very very important as far as india's dealing with the global affairs is concerned so what we are going to do is that first we are going to understand some basic facts about brics and its history then we are going to understand whether it has some of the achievements in its kitty or not and then finally we will look at challenges which the brics is increasingly facing so let us focus our attention to this image over here so brics as a group of nations 
is quite unique in its genesis because it was not formed due to initiative taken by the member countries but rather the term break was first introduced by british economist jim o'neil who was the then chairman of goldman sachs asset management in 2001 when it had become clear that brazil russia india and china were the emerging global and financial giants and so at that point of time south africa was not included in these four groups and it was just a brick group of nations he coined the term to describe the four emerging economies of the world he published a paper the world needs better economic brick for the goldman sachs global economic paper and in his paper he made a case for brick on the basis of economic trick analysis projecting that the four economies would individually and collectively occupy far greater economic space and become among the world's largest economies in the next half century or so and when chairman of goldman sachs says something even the countries listen and because of that by the time 2006 came the four countries began to have regular meetings it began with the four foreign ministers at the united nations general assembly meeting then again in 2006 the president of india brazil china were invited by the leaders of group 8 nations to participate at g8 outreach summit in st petersburg in russia at that time g8 used to include russia now it is just g7 Then in 2009 Russia hosted the first official BRIC meeting with heads of state of four countries then in 2010 BRIC became a formal institution with this formalization BRIC had become a formal force for the global political and economic transformation and then finally South Africa became a member of the bloc in 2011 and as the only African country in the bloc South Africa also represented the voice of the continent So this is a very brief history of BRICS. And as we know that it was formalized in 2010, so it has around more than a decade or around a decade since the BRICS is functioning. And so it is a decent amount of time to reflect upon its achievements. So as we know one of the important reasons why the BRICS nation came together was the article or the paper written by Mr. Jim O'Neil, but apart from that it took 6 to 7 years from there to form them a group was because of the 2008 financial crisis and so one of the main reasons for cooperation to start among these brics nations was the financial crisis of 2008 the crisis raised doubts over the sustainability of the dollar dominated monetary system and so the brics nation called for the reform of multilateral institutions in order that they reflect the structural changes in the world economy and the increasingly central role that the emerging markets are going to play and so that is reflected in minor reforms being carried out by imf because brics managed to push for institutional reform which led to the imf quota reform in 2010 which was finally implemented of course in 2016 So this is one of the good achievements which we can cite in favor of the BRICS nations. Then the establishment of two good institutions, New Development Bank and Contingency Reserve Arrangement has been one of the bigger reforms. Now New Development Bank as we all know was founded at Fortaleza Summit in 2014 and it was formed to support infrastructure and sustainable development efforts in BRICS and other underdeveloped and underserved regions. Now you can totally understand that this quite resembles and can be counterposed to world bank so when these global south nations the nations belonging to the global south came together they started developing institutions which can be counterposed to the bretton woods institutions like world bank and imf so if you look at the performance ndb has so far approved 14 projects in india amounting to around 4 billion dollars apart from that there is cra or contingency reserve arrangement that has also been established by brics nation because they understood the increasing instances of global financial crisis and because of which the brics nations signed brics contingency reserve arrangement in 2014 again in fortaleza that was the sixth brics summit now this particular arrangement aims to provide short term liquidity support to the members through currency swaps to help mitigate balance of payment crisis situation and further strengthen financial stability now if new development bank can be counterposed to world bank you can easily guess that cra is some kind of a mirror or an alternative to imf but having said all these things 
having understood the significance of bricks but still the bricks is not being able to play the role the kind of role it was envisaged because there is a lack of coherence in these countries and there are five to six very good reasons for that and one of them is the dominance of china in overall bric scenario china is not only the second largest economy of the world but has one of the most powerful armies and is also increasingly asserting as far as geo strategy is concerned we don't need to go into those discussions if you have watched dns regularly you must be knowing in what ways china is asserting itself and the recent standoff with india is one of the best example and in brics if india and china face territorial disputes and there are chances of flare ups you cannot expect that group to act in a cohesive manner then apart from that brics has a very narrow scope so one of the two most concrete results which the brics has yielded is new development bank and contingency reserve arrangement and as a counter to that china is laying too much emphasis on belt and road initiative in which china has unilateral say whereas the summits of brics have been quite vague and inconclusive they mostly focus on people to people cooperation political interaction educational and research cooperation which to be very frank would not pay a lasting dividend in creation of an institution which can counter to the developed institutions like breton and woods agreement then of course as compared to other regional and multilateral institutions it has quite restricted base of just five nations it is not flexible for the entry of new nations into the group and hence it faces the problem of reach as far as global south is concerned then if you look at overall grouping it's quite incongruous incongruous in the sense of political systems they follow for example from active democracy in india to oligarchy in russia and communism and totalitarian regime in china it's quite incongruous and if you look at other successful organizations for example g7 all of them are developed as well as they are quite near to the truest form of democracy which is practicable in the current context then on many of the global issues they have different opinions as far as the members of the brics nations are concerned just take the example of unsc reform or entry of newer nations into nuclear supplier groups they always have contradictory or conflicting opinions and then finally apart from the minor or minute reform of imf most of the other agendas of brics have not yielded any successful result just because they were not pushed enough or pursued enough by the brics nation so these are the challenges because of which the brics is not able to play the kind of role it was envisaged so from the perspective of prelims examination some of the information related to brics are very very important and apart from that challenges and achievements become important from the perspective of mains examination let us now move on to the next discussion So the next news which we have taken up appears on page number 13 Maldives parliament debates defense deal with India Now so the context is that Mali and New Delhi recently signed an agreement to jointly develop the Maldives National Defense Force Coast Guard Harbor and in this regard the Maldives parliament which is known by the name of the People's Majlis took up an emergency motion demanding greater transparency on the bilateral pact Now this is a very very important topic from the perspective of again GS paper to international relations under which India and its neighborhood relations become important and being the maritime neighbor of India Maldives has a very very special significance in India's geo strategy and so we are going to first understand that significance with respect to India then we are going to understand how has been the cooperation between these two nations in the past and then what are the concerns which still plague india and maldives relations let us now begin the discussion now first we will focus on the map and see the location of the maldives with its capital at male a lot of coral islands it is an archipelago which is very close to the indian waters now being close to indian waters is not sufficient enough reason for maldives to become important for india it is important because it is strategically located in indian ocean The 1,200 or so islands of Maldives lie next to key shipping lanes, which ensure uninterrupted energy supplies to countries like China, Japan, and India as well. 
So having good relations with Maldives is of critical importance for India in order to secure not only its energy security, but also in future to be able to control the energy supplies to China. Now we all know India's preeminent position in South Asia and its image as net security provider in Indian Ocean region. And so it is very important for India to cooperate with Maldives in security and defense sector to live up to that image of net security provider. You might know that Maldives is also a member of SARC. It is important for India to have Maldives on board to maintain its leadership in the region. Now relations with Maldives when they were not good in 2015 and 16 and hence it was the only country in the SARC which was reluctant to follow India's call for boycott of SARC summit in Pakistan after the Uri attack. And so you can easily see how important it is for India to keep Maldives on board always. Apart from that, India, especially the Kerala and Lakshadweep islands share close ethnic, linguistic and cultural ties with the people. The largest ethnic group is Dhevehin, the people who are native to the region of Maldives islands comprising today's Republic of Maldives as well as island of Minicoy and Union territory of Lakshadweep. They share same culture and speak the same language as well. And so that is why Maldives is very, very important for India. And so in the past, India has always lived up to the expectation and has come to help Maldives. For example, in 1998, when armed mercenaries attempted a coup against President Abdul Gayoom, India sent paratroopers and Navy vessels and restored the legitimate leadership under Operation Cactus. In 2004, that was the year when the tsunami struck the Indian Ocean region, India had provided assistance to Maldives and had also supported it during the drinking crisis in 2014. During COVID-19 pandemic, India rushed $250 million aid in quick time. India has also rushed medical supplies from time to time, including food and water supplies. India also maintains a naval presence in Maldives on the behest of Maldives, that is on the request of the Maldives. In return, Maldives has always supported India's claim in major international forums and organizations. And the recent government, the recently elected government has affirmed Maldives India First policy, which was reciprocated by announcing an assistance package of around $1.4 billion by the Indian government. And so what could go wrong as far as India-Maldives relations are concerned? There are three main challenges or issues in our relationship. The first is, since last two decades, there is a continuous and gradual enhancement of Chinese presence on Maldivian soil. For example, Maldives signed first country-specific free trade agreement with China in 2017, thereby becoming China's second FTA in South Asia after Pakistan. If you consider the overall foreign debt of Maldives, 70% of the foreign debt is owed to China. So you can say that Maldives is in a kind of debt trap with Chinese. Then there has been a growing trend of Chinese companies and individuals acquiring land in Maldives. The land grab is seen in excess of what East India Company had acquired during the colonial period in Maldives. And so this land grab has raised concern of Maldives being increasingly falling into an economic neo-colonial influence of China. Although the new government of President Soleil has affirmed that Maldives will scrap the FTA with China and investigate all the Chinese land grabs in Maldives, but due to the debt trap in which the Maldives has already fallen, it seems impossible to do that right now. Then the term of last President Mr. Yamin was the worst phase of India-Maldives relations. He was not only a dictator, anti-democratic person, who declared emergency in Maldives and halted the functioning of Maldives parliament and also arrested several opposition leaders but was also extremely anti-India and pro-China. He solidified relations with China without taking India into confidence. Under President Yamin's regime, Malay had terminated the agreement it entered into with GMR that is an Indian company for modernization of international airport and various other actions which were taken by President Yamin are very very difficult to reverse and hence the hangover of the term of President Yamin is going to create concerns as far as India-Maldives relations are concerned. And the third important factor which is a cause of concern for India is the growing radicalization in Maldivian society. 
Now you'd be surprised to know that the Maldives had become the country with the highest rate of foreign fighters per capita in the world. For its population, it sent the maximum number of terrorists to fight for Islamic State. And so, after the debacle or after the decimation of Islamic State, all these foreign fighters are now returning back into the country and that has led to an apprehension by India that will lead to an increase in the influence of Islamic State and hence it will help in boosting radicalization in that sense. The relations between India and Maldives are now in an upswing because the current government and the president are quite favorable to India. But just like the past, the things can change very drastically. And so India needs to build on the positive public image that it has to further cement the ties between India and Maldives. Dealing with the bigger neighbor, China. This lead article appears on page number 6. And it is written by former foreign secretary and ambassador to China, Ms. Nirupma Rao. The article, although tangential to the direct UPSC syllabus, has some important takeaways as far as recent India-China flare-up is concerned. In this particular article, the author says that just like India and China, the relationship between Russia and China was also marred by a lot of boundary disputes and in time, they have been able to resolve those disputes. And so first she discusses what were the factors which led to the normalization of China and Russia relations. And then she applies the same to India-China relations and she observes that most of the factors which led to the normalization of relation between China and Russia are actually missing in case of India and China relations. And so we are going to discuss these points in a brief manner. For the normalization of ties between any two neighbors is the resolution of the border dispute between the two. And so in May 1991, an agreement on the eastern sector of national boundaries was concluded by the two countries, resolving 98% of the outstanding boundary issues. Then, after you have done that, comes development of confidence building measures or CBMs in border regions. They also agreed that the zone of military CBMs would be 100 km on each side of the border. Then, in order to resolve the boundary disputes between such massive two nations and neighbors, you need willingness of the bigger power. So, Soviet Union was much much bigger than China 30 years ago. And so, after Mikhail Gorbachev came into power, the Soviet Union considered a long-standing Chinese demand to allow the adoption of the median line of navigational channel of Amurusiri River as the boundary between the two countries. So, in a way, bigger power needs to accede to the demands of a smaller nation. Then after that, one of the defining features in their relation from 1960s was military confrontation became a matter of past. Then a strategic partnership of equality and trust which has emerged since then and as we can see that they are putting up quite a joint front against current global power that is United States of America. So as far as the normalization of Russia and China ties are concerned, the first step was of course a resolution of border dispute but if you see in case of India and China, we have not anywhere close to that. We have a long and unsettled border which like most other neighbors creates most of the problems. Then as far as confidence building measures are concerned, just like Russia and China, we also have a lot of confidence building measures. And if you know, India has signed agreement on the maintenance of peace and tranquility along line of actual control in 1993, then again in 1996, and the latest being border defense cooperation in 2030. But according to the author, if your border disputes perpetuate, confidence building measures are of no use. Then as far as military confrontation avoidance is concerned, in the western sector of boundary, China was practicing a forward policy and confrontation in Galwan in summer of 2020 is the best example unlike the case of Russia and China. Then if you remember, we discussed that in case of Russia or Soviet Union and China's relation, it was the willingness of the bigger power to undertake unilateral concessions or to initiate the talks and yield something which the smaller power requires. In case of India and China, China is the bigger power. Unlike Soviet Union under Gorbachev, has never signaled its willingness to make asymmetric or unilateral concessions to India or act in a manner, especially in our neighborhood, that enhances India's trust and confidence. So as far as the strategic convergence is concerned between Russia and China, it was very, very high, especially after the Cold War, US emerged as a clear 
global superpower but if you look at india and china there is hardly any strategic association of india with that country although we have a lot of institutions on which we are member together for example brics wto but there are more issues on which our matters and views diverge for example quad military exercises trades and various other matters and so you can clearly see that the factors which led to the normalization of russia and china are absolutely missing from that of india and china and that is why it is taking so long in order to solve these matters of boundary dispute so just at the outset we discussed that this particular discussion is not very very relevant from the perspective of pre or mains examination but can come very handy for those who are going to appear for interview for 2020 UPSC civil services examination so this last news which we have taken for today's discussion appears on page number 13 iran iaea reach deal on inspections so tehran will continue to give access to un inspectors to its declared nuclear sites for 3 more months now it has been a lot of time since we last discussed iran nuclear enrichment program and nuclear deal which was signed between P5 plus 1 which is US France United Kingdom Russia China and Germany and Iran because of which Iran had to give access to its uranium enrichment sites to UN inspectors because of which this news appears in the newspaper today and so let us quickly discuss the Iran nuclear deal then unilateral american withdrawal from this particular agreement its implications for india So in 2015 Iran struck the nuclear deal also known as JCPOA Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with P5+1 in exchange of lifting economic sanctions by USA Iran agreed to limit its enrichment of uranium under the watch of UN inspectors and if you see this particular chart this is just to give you an idea of what JCPOA means for Iran so as far as power level power which is going to be derived from the nuclear power plants is concerned 40 megawatts was restricted to 20 megawatts instead of natural uranium low enriched uranium had to be used so what was the amount of plutonium which was to be produced by iran was sufficient to make one or two bombs per year earlier but after the deal it became less than 1 by 6 of the bomb per year so basically it is not like iran could not pursue or cannot pursue its nuclear enrichment program but the speed is going to be much lesser the quality of the plutonium is also something which is more difficult to weaponize earlier there was no restrictions as to how the iran is going to use the spent fuel now there were a lot of conditions on how to use the spent fuel as well and similarly there were general plutonium restrictions on iran as well the deal was going on smoothly until donald trump became the president of united states and pulled out of accord in may 2018 despite the assurances that iran was in compliance with the terms of multilateral agreement and these assurances were being given by iaea or international atomic energy agency the agency which was given the task of monitoring iran's nuclear enrichment program his reasons were that the deal did not address iran's ballistic missile program or its involvement in the regional conflicts and so he wanted iran's ballistic missile program actually the delivery mechanism which would ultimately deliver these nuclear bombs to be included in the treaty now the withdrawal of usa from the deal of course adversely affected the economy of iran it halted promised international business deals and dealt a very heavy blow to iran's already ailing economy in the time since the trump administration has said any country that imports iranian crude will face us sanctions it further worsened the economic situation of iran so as a counter to that iran warned that it would soon resume nuclear activities outside of jcpoa following successive waves of crippling us sanctions that has blocked iran's oil exports which also damaged its currency and its access to products such as medicines so nuclear enrichment is her move in the direction and according to the government of iran it is not an offensive but rather a defensive strategy a kind of maximum resistance to the policy of maximum pressure as far as implications of this particular development on india is concerned we already know that us sanctions on iran has impacted india's oil imports from iran and therefore india is pursuing the agenda of diversification of imports as far as crude oil is concerned also india's investment in region like chabahar etc 
have been dealt a very very heavy blow due to American sanctions. It has also impacted India's exports to Iran like pharmaceutical products because you cannot do trade with a country on which America is applying sanctions so harshly. And with the involvement of China, the changing politics of the region has become even more important for India because it is adversely affecting soft diplomatic power of India. So from the perspective of prelims examination, a question on JCPOA has already been asked. And so that is why it is important to have some basic idea about Iran nuclear deal. Then this article level platforms appears on page number six in the form of column. And we all know that a new law in Australia has sought to make technology platforms such as Google and Facebook pay news publishers for use of their content. And that has created a lot of issues. And all these issues have already been discussed in our daily news simplified dated 31st of January, which was done by both Baswasar and Navid sir. Navid sir took up this article, discussed not just the Australian law, the issues which it creates. How will this new law help publishers and much more than that? So it is advised that go through this very, very pertinent discussion on the new Australian law to make technology platforms, Google and Facebook pay news publishers. 